uh, of uh, a five point or uh, five sermons. Actually, uh, one, two, three. Oh, there's six, and, and you can see them on the screen there. I'm not going to go through them, but uh, you can see each week we're going to take another look at the Christmas narrative. So we're going to do this chronologically. So we're going to start, and we're going to look at what happened up to the birth of Jesus, and we're going to look at it chronologically. The first one we're going to look at is the promise of John the Baptist's birth. So if you have your Bibles or your phone, or perhaps you're one of those that have this passage memorized, which is good. Uh, Luke chapter 1, if you turn there, we're going to have that read in another moment. And I forgot to dismiss the children. So if you're five and down, uh, there is a snack room in the basement. Or if you're really famished and you think you're going to die, you could go down and have a snack, but you should come back up. All right, so we're with John the Baptist's birth. And uh, le let me say a few things that I think will help us today. Uh, I'm going to paint a picture to you of the political culture of that particular day and age. And I'm going to paint that picture because I believe it's very similar to our present culture, our political culture. I'm going to talk about the corporate spiritual culture of that particular day and age because it's very similar to our uh, corporate spiritual cu culture. And uh, I'm also going to uh, paint a picture of the individual spiritual culture because, again, it's very similar to the day and age that we live in. So let me tell you about the political culture before we read the text. I'm going to tell you what's happening in politics. Well, I'm going to tell it to you uh, briefly and quickly. Rome was in power. Rome was pantheistic. Who knows what pantheistic means? Anybody? Uh, three people. Good. Uh, pantheistic means that there was many gods, but the chief god was a guy named, anybody know this? Caesar. And so, really, Caesar was like, had godlike status there. To obey Rome, you'd be totally fine. But Rome was very oppressive. You needed to pay your taxes to Rome, and you needed to keep all your thoughts, your concerns, and your questions to yourself, and you'd do good in the Roman environment. You needed to pay your taxes. You needed to be obedient. There was no democracy. Your opinion was not valid. Life was very expendable. Life was very hard, and life was very short. And actually, there was, very, there was little or no morals in Rome. As a matter of fact, I found a website that said Rome was the pervert's paradise. It was very immoral, it was very evil, and uh, it was just an awful place. And uh, Canada, while certainly not Rome, is knocking at Rome's door. Now the good news of that, just in passing, is that's the environment Jesus preached in. So it doesn't mean we should throw in the towel. Let me talk also now, very quickly, about the, the corporate spiritual culture. Well, let me talk about the then known church. The then known church was the people of Israel. There was two kinds of Israelites, two kinds of Jews in the Roman Empire. There are Jews that lived in Palestine, and there was Jews that were all around the world, and they were known as Jews of the diaspora. And so that just means they didn't live right in Israel. They didn't live in then called, the place called Palestine. Um, and uh, let me tell you about these people. First of all, there's a whole bunch of them that were cultural Jews. They were not religious Jews. They did not serve God. They were basically cultural Jews, and they kept all the culture up, but they really didn't serve God. Secondly, there was a very, there's a large group of people that were very religious but didn't serve God. Okay? Uh, excuse the similarities to Canada, okay? <laughs> uh, a very large group of people that were very religious, uh, but they didn't worship God. And then there was a small, small group of people that were very passionate about God and were waiting for a fresh visitation of God's presence. Although that group of people, that group of Jews was very, very, very small. So you got it? You got three groups of Jews. You got number, number one Jews. They were Jews that were simply political Jews. They were national Jews, you know, uh, but they were not religious. Then you've got the religious Jews who weren't really spiritual. They were just religious. They go to church at, you know, it's like the C&E Christians. 
You don't want to see any Christian, is it? Christmas and Easter, right? And so, you know, you know, just kind of like religious but not spiritual. But then there's a small, small group of Jews, and they were very passionate about Yahweh, and they wanted to serve Yahweh. Well, uh, the spiritual individual culture, well, it basically was what I've just said. Uh, many had left the worship of true God but still went to church. Just let that sit for a minute. <laughs> uh, there was a bunch of people um, that said they were Christians, said they were religious, but they didn't know God. And then there was a small group, very small people who were passionate about their faith. So that's the background. So Mary Lee is going to come. And uh, she's going to read our text, and uh, I see you're all ready for her, and you have that ready. So, Mary Lee, preach away, sister. Our reading is from Luke 1, 5 to 25. <coughs> Excuse me. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abia, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commands and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of people were praying out without at the time of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell on him. But the angel said to him, Fear not, Zachariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink, <clears throat> shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered, Answering, said to him, I am Gabriel, that stands in the presence of God, and am sent to speak to you and to show you these glad tidings. <clears throat> but behold, you shall be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because you believe not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he took so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, 
Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. In our text, I've labeled this week the promise. We have two key people in our text. We have person number one, Zechariah, and his wife, Elizabeth. We note in verse number seven, they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were, they were well advanced in years. Now, barrenness in the Jewish culture, especially in Old Testament times, was seen as a curse. And so if you are barren, it's because you're bad. If you are barren, it's because you're doing something wrong and God has judged you. It was seen as, as physical, emotional, spiritual barrenness. Uh, to be barren was to be empty. To be barren was to be hopeless. And the pain of barrenness is seen in a number of texts in the Old Testament. And barrenness seemed to represent the condition of many people's hearts in that day and age and in that culture. There was a, there was a whole lot of duty going on, but very little passion. A whole lot of duty, but very little passion. I saw this uh, funny, uh, funny, funny, funny post. That's what they're called. Funny post on uh, uh, face plant there the other day. And, and they showed a picture of a football game. And they had a shot of the fans. I don't know if you saw this. And it's snowing to beat the band out. And the fans are all dressed up, and they got toques on and scarves. You see this one? And they're all, the snow's pelting down, and they're all caked with snow. And the caption read something like, and it's too cold for you to go to church? So we are part of a culture where, you know what, there's a lot of church going on, but, but maybe there's not a lot of passion about church. There is a lot of talk about Jesus, but there's kind of this barrenness, this, this emptiness. There is even a fair amount of law-keeping, but little heart desire. Jesus used these words in Mark chapter 7, verse 7. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I don't know if you read that and think, wow, they're probably talking about Frank two pews back. Or maybe they're talking about the first church of the Frigidaire down the corner. But, they're not, but are you sure? Are you absolutely positive? It's not you. It's not me. It's so easy just to get caught up in the culture of church. Going through the right motions. This is easy. I, I've been to a Catholic church sometimes. That's very confusing. You're up, you're down, you know, kneel, you, 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 you look. This one's easy. You could, you could pull this off just fine. Just sit there like a deadbeat. You know, smile, grunt once in a while, but, but we more or less lead... We more or less leave you alone, yeah? You don't feel too picked on, do you? It's easy to sit in church. But here we are, barren. But there's a promise for barrenness. Hallelujah! There's a promise for barrenness. Let me talk about their barrenness because the Bible says something very helpful for us. If you look in verse number six, they were both righteous before God. They're walking in all the commands and ordinances of God, and they were actually, they were blameless. So what that means is their barrenness wasn't because they were dirty, rotten eggs. 
their barrenness wasn't because they were bad people, because they were like swift or clean. Like, like they were going through life and they were, they were like squeaky clean. God saw them as blameless. This is very important because their barrenness was not a result of their own sin or their own evilness. So here's the story. It's been read to us. This is a picture uh, that uh, Matthew took uh, back in uh, when Zacharias went. Oh, no, it was Luke that took the picture. Sorry. Uh, Luke took the picture. And uh, here is Zechariah. We, we know that he's an old dude. Uh, we, uh, we also know that there are 24 divisions of priests that would actually perform the church religious temple duties. And uh, uh, you would go to the temple uh, for one week, twice a year, your division. And you would go there and you would do as you were told. And what Zechariah did, and I'll show you the next slide that Luke took a picture of. Uh, he would do this one time in his life. All right? Because there are so many priests, there's so many people. So you would get to do this only one time. And uh, you would go in and you would burn incense one time. So uh, there's a little pot of incense. Let me describe what would happen. He would take coals off of the altar outside the outside of the temple so uh we'll pass this over let's say uh, this is the altar area outside the temple he would take a a couple of coals off there and put them in a, a little pot uh container much as like we see up here and he would carry that into the temple go inside the front doors the temple had two parts a bigger part and a littler part the holy place, the most holy place. He would go up to the front of the most holy place. He would then take incense and he would dump the incense on top of the burning coals and he would set that on the altar and after he did that, he would lay on the floor. All right? And so he'd be laying down on the floor, kind of like this, and he would be, uh, he'd be in prayer. He'd be thinking about Yahweh. He'd be praying. Uh, but you have to also understand, oh, I was, I was falling asleep down there. Yeah, you also have to understand, like, this guy's, like, really, really nervous. Like, this, this, is, this, is, this is as hot and heavy as holiness ever gets. He's laying down there. And as he's laying down there, and, and you know the story because we've had it read, he's, he's prostrate before the Lord, and... Uh, the incense is rising, and all of a sudden, <laughs> he senses somebody's there, right? And he's thinking, well, maybe it's, it, it, it can't be, nobody's coming in there, because only one guy can go in there, right? And so he gets this visitation, and he's down, I, I'll do it this way so you can see. <laughs> well, if you're, this way you should sit at the front. Uh, he obviously senses this, and I get the idea that he goes, he kind of looks up and he goes, and he has this visitation, this angel. And he's thinking, I'm cooked. That's what goes through his head, right? It's not like, oh, want to go to Tim Hortons for a coffee after? No, like, I mean, he's thinking, I'm cooked. And so then Gabe tells him this story. Oh, guess what? You're going to have a kid. And you've got to understand, he's an old dude. You don't have kids when you're old. Barrenness or not, you don't have kids when you're old as Lenny. Right? <laughs> and as the story progresses, Gabriel says, you know what? You're going to have a child... And this child, you're going to name John. Not Zechariah, John. And then it has been read, so I won't repeat it. There's a promise of two things. Here's the first thing. <coughs> Zechariah and his wife, they're going to get healed from their personal barrenness. 
which means they're going to have a baby. Which I suppose if you've never had babies and you're old, that would be good. It would not be good for Ruth and I now. She said to share that. It would be very bad. Very, very bad. <laughs> but if you've never had children, if you've, and you've always wanted children, maybe 70 is good to have a kid. Oh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I, but here's the promise. But you have to see how that, that barrenness is translated out of not only the womb of Elizabeth, but that barrenness that is in the culture is going to get miraculously set free and healed. Okay, are you with me? So, he invites a nation to get healed in this prophecy. And he invites individuals to be healed. And that's what this story is about. It's a story of invitation. So he's going to heal their personal barrenness. Uh, the angel says, don't be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer is heard. I'm not sure. Maybe he was nuts. It's possible. And he's laying down there. I don't know if, I don't know how many times, it, maybe he prayed this today. I don't know. He, he might have said, oh, uh, God, uh, yeah, my wife still has not had a child. And although we're old and stricken in years, we could still do it. We've got enough... Can I say spit and vinegar over to the pulpit? And try, my wife wants me to say energy. Uh, uh, we, still have, we still have enough energy to pull this off. Maybe he prayed that. I don't know, but we know that he's praying. And against all odds, against all odds, the angel said, yeah, <laughs> you're going to have a kid. You're going to have a baby. But then he says this. He sends out an invitation for a nation to be healed. Watch this. If you still have your phone open or your Bible or whatever, look at verse 16 and 17. He, that's this baby, he will turn... Uh, Many of the children of Israel to their God. He will turn many of the children to their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. So this is what Luke is writing about. This is Advent. Jesus is going to come and he's going to turn a nation to God. Yeah. So when Jesus is here, he does everything with his power. <laughs> and the donkeys missed it. Don't be a donkey and miss this. Just saying. So we know in Luke chapter 13, Jesus has been preaching for three years now, and they missed it. They just missed it. Luke 13, uh, 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. L listen to the words of Jesus. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. You know, when people are sick, uh, I find out afterwards and I say, well, you should have told me you were sick. You should have told me that you were in the hospital. And then people say this. What do they say? I didn't want to bother you. I, I, wanted, I want you, when I'm sick, I want Lisa LaFlamme from CTV News to interview me. <laughs> uh, just, you know, right? I want everybody to know. You know, the pastor's got a cold. Please get, we're going to have an interview from CTV. We got CNN coming the next day, you know. You know, I'd even let Trump come in and interview me. I would. I would. Just, uh, Don't miss Jesus because you think your life's all right without him. 
Don't miss the invitation because you think you're pulling off life okay by yourself. Thousands did in the Bible. Jesus is standing over the city of Jerusalem. He's weeping over the city because he says these words. I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath, but you, you wouldn't let me. Don't miss Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. So the invitation goes out. The invitation is out there. Be healed. Tur- turn to God. Turn to the Messiah. Uh, Israel's ears were deaf. Their eyes were closed. They missed God. Are you ready? Jesus is coming. Jesus is He's inviting. He's inviting the country of Canada. He's inviting the city of St. Thomas. He's inviting the church of St. Thomas. He's inviting the congregation of STPA. He's inviting the Cusick family. He's inviting Peter Cusick. And he's waiting for me, us, 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 us to say yes. Come and heal our barrenness. Come and heal our barrenness. So there's an invitation here. Turn, turn and be healed from your barrenness. I believe there's an invitation at this Advent season. It's the season of the coming one. And I believe Jesus is knocking on the door of Canada. I believe he's knocking on the door of the city of St. Thomas. I believe he's knocking on the door of the church of St. Thomas. I believe he's knocking on the door of STPA. I believe he's knocking on the door of 14 Neal Ave, which is where I live, by the way. I believe he's knocking on the door of the heart of Peter Cusick, and he's wanting me, us, 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 to turn and be healed from our barren. Turn afresh to our coming king. He invites individuals to be healed. Like the barren womb of Elizabeth, there's been an emptiness in your heart. There's been a dryness. There's been a vacuum in your spiritual life. There's been a desolation in your spiritual life. And Jesus says, turn. Turn. He is here today. He is here to bring healing. He is here to bring fulfillment. He is here to bring true joy. Turn to Jesus. Well, perhaps you're here this morning and you've never surrendered once to Jesus, never once. The Bible tells us the soul who sins is the one who will die. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible tells us God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Today, you can be healed of your sin, your waywardness, your rebellion, and ultimately your barrenness, just like Elizabeth was. Jesus can heal you and make your life full. I want to prophesy over you right now. I want to prophesy over STPA right now. I want to prophesy over the the church of St. Thomas that's meeting all across our city right now. I want to prophesy over the town, the city of St. Thomas. Be healed of your barrenness. Be healed of your barrenness. I love this part that was read to us. And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were were completed, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife conceived and she hid herself. And she said this, the Lord has dealt with me. And, And he looked on me and he took away my reproach. Jesus has come. He's come to my life, 
14 Neo Ave, 144 Wellington Street, the church that meets across the city, the city of St. Thomas, the Lord has come. And he's offered healing of barrenness. So here's the promise. You ready? It's, it's really quite outstanding. Jesus said this in John 6 and 37. All that the Father giveth me will come to me, and he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Jesus will not cast away St. Thomas if St. Thomas will accept the promise and welcome the presence and Jesus as King of Kings. He will not reject our city. He will not reject the church of St. Thomas across our city if the church will welcome the presence and the person of Jesus. He will not cast out STPA if we will accept the promise of Jesus. He will not cast you out if you will accept the promise of Jesus. He said it very plainly. Wow. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. 